Hey, good morning, friends. It's Pastor Justin here with Hartzell United Methodist Church. So glad you've chosen to join us again as we continue our Fresh Air series again this week. Let us begin this morning with a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, we invite you into this space. We ask that you would meet to us, that you would speak to us. We ask that you would restore our souls. That in this time and space that we would have ears to hear and a heart that is willing to respond to whatever it is that you have to say to us in this moment. We ask this in the precious name of Jesus Christ, our Lord and our Savior. Amen. Well, our reading from this morning is from one of the most famous passages in all of Scripture, from Genesis chapter 1, verse 1 through chapter 2, verse 3. Let us hear the words of the Lord. In the beginning... God created the heavens and the earth. Now the earth was formless and empty. And darkness was over the surface of the deep. And the Spirit of God was hovering over the waters. And God said, Let there be light. And there was light. And God saw that the light was good. And he separated the light from the darkness. God called the light day. And the darkness he called night, and there was evening, and there was morning, the first day. And God said, Let there be an expanse between the waters to separate the water from the water. So God made the expanse and separated the water under the expanse from the water above it, and it was so. And God called the expanse sky, and there was evening, and there was morning, the second day. And God said, Let the water under the sky be gathered to one place, and let dry ground appear. And it was so. God called the dry ground land, and the gathered waters he called seas. And God saw that it was good. Then God said, Let the land produce vegetation, seed-bearing plants and trees on the land. that bear fruit with seed in it according to their various kinds. And it was so. The land produced vegetation, plants bearing seed according to their kinds, and trees bearing fruit with seed in it according to their kinds. And God saw that it was good. And there was evening, and there was morning, the third day. And God said, Let there be lights in the expanse of the sky to separate the day from the night. And let them serve as signs to mark seasons and days and years. And let them be lights in the expanse of the sky to give light on the earth. And it was so. God made two great lights. The greater light to govern the day and the lesser light to govern the night. He also made the stars. God set them in the expanse of the sky to give light on the earth. To govern the day and the night and to separate light from darkness. And God saw that it was good, and there was evening, and there was morning, the fourth day. And God said, Let the water teem with living creatures, and let birds fly above the earth, <coughs> across the expanse of the sky. So God created the great creatures of the sea, and every living and moving thing with which the water teems according to their kinds, and every winged bird according to its kind. And God saw that it was good. God blessed them and said, Be fruitful and increase in number and fill the water in the seas and let the birds increase on the earth. And there was evening and there was morning, the fifth day. And God said, Let the land produce living creatures according to their kinds, livestock, creatures that move along the ground, and wild animals, each according to its kind. And it was so. God made the wild animals according to their kinds, the livestock according to their kinds, and all the creatures that move on the ground according to their kinds. And God saw that it was good. Then God said, Let us make human in our image, in our likeness, and let them rule over the fish of the sea and the birds of the air, over the livestock, over all the earth, and over all the creatures that move along the ground. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him male and female. He created them. 
God blessed them and said to them, Be fruitful and increase in number. Fill the earth and subdue it. Rule over the fish of the sea and the birds of the air and over every living creature that moves on the ground. Then God said, I give you every seed-bearing plant on the face of the whole earth and every tree that has fruit with seed in it. They will be yours for food. And to all the beasts of the earth and the birds of the air and the creatures that move on the ground, everything that has the breath of life in it, I give every green plant for food. And it was so. And God saw all that he had made, and it was very good. And there was evening, and there was morning, the sixth day. Thus the heavens and the earth were completed in all their vast array. By the seventh day God had finished the work he had been doing. So on the seventh day he rested from all of his work. And God blessed the seventh day and made it holy, because on it he rested from all the work of creating that he had done. This is the word of God that is spoken for us, the people of God. Thanks be to God. There's an old Doonesbury cartoon. But Bernie, who's the boss of the company, has just arrived at the office very late one night. It's about midnight, but every single light in the entire building is on. He walks into the office and he sees several people who were there spending the night crashing deadlines for the next morning. And so he calls everyone together and he gives them a little talk about the dangers of burnout. No product launch, he says, is worth that kind of sacrifice. Highly stressed, chronically fatigued employees cannot give their best and I need your best. And so from now on, here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to have the power to the building shut off at 5 p.m. I want you to go home. I want you to live your lives. I want you to rest. And to that, Kim, who's kind of the most level-headed one in the group, usually she pipes up, he's gone mad. You say, here he is, he's trying to tend to their souls. He's trying to care for their souls, but she's worked this way for so long that she takes what is actually sound wisdom as if it's utter foolishness. I'm reminded of a story. It's a story about a woman by the name of Brenda Heist. Brenda was an ordinary, everyday woman, a person that was just like you and me. She was married, she had two kids, she had a good job down as, at the local car dealership. She was the bookkeeper there. And then one day, back in February of 2002, she just up and vanished. No one really knew where she went. Her, fans, her friends and her family just assumed that the worst had happened. The cops were called in. They began to investigate. They had countless interviews with friends and family and co-workers and neighbors. They talked to everyone they could, but they couldn't find even a single lead. Well, eventually the case went cold and Brenda was presumed to be dead. Her family had a funeral. They grieved her loss. And then some 11 years later, in May of 2013, she resurfaced. She popped up in Florida where she had been living on the street for the last 11 years. And when they talked to her about it, she said, well, all the stress and the problems of life just got to me. They got to be too much to bear. And so I just decided on a whim to up and leave it all behind, to get away from it all, all because she had burnt out. Well, that story may be a little bit extreme, The reality is there are points in every one of our lives where we are just about to hit our breaking point. We're just about to hit the wall. We're zapped of strength and we want to give up and throw in the towel. I mean, just ask yourself for a minute, do any of these statements sound familiar to you? Your passion is faded across the board. You feel numb and you no longer feel any emotional highs or lows. Your reactions have become disproportionate to the situation. Everybody drains you. You're growing cynical. Nothing satisfies you. Nothing feels good anymore. You can't think straight or logically because brain fog has kind of set in. Your productivity is tanking. You're starting to self-medicate, whether that's with drugs or food or something else altogether. Rest and sleep no longer refuel you. You don't laugh anymore. 
If any one of those statements sound true to you, it may be that you are beginning to head toward burnout. The more of those statements that are true of your life, the more likely that burnout is just days away. I mean, the fact is, life can very easily get out of balance. It's very easy to, to throw ourselves into work in all the things that we have to do. I mean, we live in a workaholic society, a society that values and, 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 and defines us based on our work. I mean, if you ask somebody who they are, the first thing they're going to tell you is what they do. We live in a world where we define our value, our worth, our self-identity by what we do for a living. We define our productivity by how busy we are. And as I said a few weeks ago, we've even bought into that lie that if we're not busy, then we're just being lazy. In fact, back in 2013, the Business Insider came out with a magazine article. And in that article, they were interviewing several of the top CEOs in the country. And they were glorifying the 70 to 100 hour a week work week as the ideal towards which every one of us should be shooting and striving. The article went on to call the balanced life a smokescreen for a desire not to do any work. But yet we've seen throughout this series that balance is absolutely critical to restoring our souls, that we can't live outside of God's intended design for our lives or we're going to end up crashing and burning. Like on that old TV show, Wipeout, right? It, it, you can see the writing on the wall. You know at some point along the path, we're going to hit that wall and we're going to fall and wipe out and burn out if we're not balanced. Anthony Headley puts it this way in his book, Reframing Your Ministry. He says, a very large amount of human suffering and frustration is caused by the fact that men and women are simply not content to be the sort of beings that God made us to be. Instead, we try to persuade ourselves that we are really beings of a very different kind. Kent Crockett put it like this, burnout occurs when we give out more than we take in. When, when, when we go from giving out all the time to giving up. He says that cars that aren't refueled eventually run out of gas. Wells that are not replenished eventually run dry. Batteries that are not recharged eventually have no power. And we aren't any different. A Christian that is not refueled, replenished, and recharged often will eventually burn out and die. I mean, just think about this. The Bible tells us again and again that even Jesus needed times to get away and recharge. He needed times to get away from the crowd, away from the hectic pace of life, away from ministry to simply sit and dwell in the presence of his Father. And if Jesus, the one who is the Son of God, needed to get away to restore his soul, how much more do we need to get away, slow down, to restore our souls? Let me just take a look at this text for today. It's a very familiar story. We've all heard it countless times before. It's all over, uh, you know, the modern scientific debates and questions and about how the world began. But I want to look at this text from a radically different perspective today. I want you to, to take a look at it through a new set of eyes. Because this story isn't just about the creation of the physical world. It's about the creation of time. Of time. I mean, seven days are counted off through the course of this story. And in a single week, it, it, it is effectively initiating the very first calendar, which shows that from the very beginning, time and how we use time is on the mind of God. I mean, just think about day one. Right? Day one is the creation of light. God says, let there be light, and there's light, and he sees the light's good. Right? It's the creation of light. And what, what is he doing? He's, he's separating the light from the darkness. He's establishing night and day, two very distinct periods of time, so that at the end of the verse it says there was evening and there was morning, the first day. There's this, 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 this idea that God is establishing two distinct periods periods of time, one that is for work and one that is for rest, day and night. From the beginning, this idea of the balance 
of time and work is built into the very structures of the universe that God creates. And that means if we're trying to burn the candle at both ends, if we're trying to always be on the go, if we're trying to, to work, 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 work all the time, then we're not being the kind of people that God actually created us to be. That from the beginning, He created us to have a time for work and a time for rest. Two distinct periods of time. That throughout this story, what God wants us to see is there's this, this balance of work and rest that is as serving as his, his own pattern. In fact, I want to suggest that this story provides a simple three-step model for how we begin to live and avoid burnout and go about restoring our souls. And the first is this, that we restore our souls when we build regular, consistent periods of rest into our lives. Regular, consistent periods of rest. It's most clear at the very end of this story. Genesis chapter 2, on the seventh day, by the seventh day, God had finished the work he had been doing. So on the seventh day, he rested from all of his work. That God takes one day in seven to rest. That he establishes a Sabbath day. And that term Sabbath is a very important term in the Bible. It's used 144 times in the scriptures. That means it's, it's important to us. That means it's a fundamental principle. It means that, that this is something that, that God takes seriously. I mean, just think about it. The Sabbath is embedded into the creation narrative itself. And it's also embedded into the Old Testament law and the Ten Commandments. In fact, if you read through the Ten Commandments in Deuteronomy chapter 5 and Exodus chapter 20, you'll see that the Sabbath law gets more space than any of the other commandments that are given. Not only that, the Sabbath day is the first thing in all of Scripture that God calls holy. The very first thing. I find that so remarkable because... And, you know, I would think, you know, the first thing that, that the Bible is going to call holy is, is, is some kind of sacred object or a temple or, or maybe at least God himself. But the first thing that, that God calls holy is this day of rest. Every other day in this story, God stops, he looks around, he sees, and he says that it's good. But we get here to, to Genesis chapter 2 when he's established the day of Sabbath and he says that that he he blesses it and he makes it holy in other words rest is a sacred and holy thing to God rest is holy it's important it's it's effectively where this whole story has been driving right day one day two day three day four day five day six all the way driving to day seven driving to this moment of rest because God knows that rest is critical for restoring our souls that we need time to rest to restore our souls in fact the, the Jewish uh, the Jewish rabbis they tell us that in the Hebrew language that creation doesn't take six days it takes seven that God finishes creating the world by creating rest. Rest itself is a part of the stuff that God has created. It's not just something he does when he's done, right? It, it's a part of what he creates because a world without rest is incomplete. A world without at rest is empty. A world without rest is out of balance. That rest is critical for the restoration of our souls and that means that we need to build regular consistent periods of rest into our lives to take that sabbath one day in seven to rest to take days away in spiritual retreat to make sure that we use all of our vacation every single year because rest is critical for the restoration of our souls what's even more astonishing is, is that God doesn't just build rest into the seventh day of the week. In the law, he, he commands that the land itself is to go vacant one year out of every seven. That there's to be a sabbatical year. That, that a field isn't to be 
planted during that seventh year in order that it might be restored. And, and even in the first six days of creation, I find this remarkable, that, that God builds regular consistent periods of rest into his life in the other six days. I mean, just think about this, right? This, this is God, God who is creating the world, which means he, he could have snapped his fingers, it could have been done in an instant. That God could have said, the world was created and it was done. Just like that. It, it wouldn't have taken six days to do. He could have created it in an instant. Crossed it off its li his list and went on to the next thing. I mean, that's what I would have done. I mean, I got this whole list of stuff that always needs to be done. With deadlines and responsibilities and all this stuff. And, and the sooner I finish one, the sooner I can move on to the next. But yet that's not the picture that we get of, of who God is. That we, we get this remarkable picture of a God who paces himself. A God who takes his time. A God who isn't in a hurry to create the world. He's not simply rushing from one text to one one task to the next. He he takes the time to pause, to stop, to enjoy the moment, to assess, to look out. I mean at the end of every single day he stops, he looks around, he assesses what he's done, and he says it's good, and then he waits till the next day to do something else. I find that remarkable. He, he doesn't just wait till the end of the week to rest. He stops every single day. And it's punctuated by these, these moments of rest. Have you ever noticed that even a 15-minute break can revive your soul? can give you a second burst of energy to make it through the next chunk of time. Anthony Headley puts it like this. He says, how much will we try to accomplish during a given period of time? Will we cram our plates full with more than we can humanly handle? Or will we set a reasonable limit to how much we attempt? Even though God could have done it all in a day, he didn't. Some things just take time. We can't always be at it. We need to take breaks between our work, allowing pause to assess and to permit our creative juices to flow. God himself does this. He, he doesn't rush madly about or exhibit furious activity. Rather, when he finished the day's task, he surveys the results and satisfied with a well job well done, he pauses until another day. If only we would take the same approach in our activities. To work well, we must find time to rest or we will exhaust our resources. Rest constitutes the God-ordained way to invest our human capital to produce greater dividends in our lives. That we restore our souls when we build regular, consistent periods of rest into our lives every single day. And when we take special times of rest every single week and every so often, when we, we take time to simply dwell in the presence of Jesus. Secondly, we restore our souls when we define natural boundaries and limits around our work. Boundaries and limits. I mean, this entire story is a story where God is creating boundaries. Right? He separates things over and over. He separates the light from the dark. He separates the water from the air. He separates the water from the ground. He, he separates the night and the day. He separates the Sabbath from all of the other six days of creation. He, he creates every species and animal according to the limits of its kind. Again and again, he is creating boundaries. Right? He, he's in the boundary making business. Boundaries are a natural part of the very structure of the universe that God is creating. And, and that means if we're to, to be the kind of people that God wants us to be, then we need to live within the natural boundaries and limits with which God has established and created us. But yet, the reality is we're the only being in God's entire creation that struggles to live within his intended boundaries. I mean, throughout the stories, what, what do we see? God, God speaks, and it happens. God speaks, and it's so. There's obedience. 
right? All of creation obeys the very voice of God. They are content to live within the boundaries that he's establishing. But not Adam and Eve. Right? Adam and Eve disobey the voice of the Lord. They, they violate the boundaries that God has established. They, he, he's given them all, every green plant for food, except the one tree in the center of the garden, but they're not content to live within the boundaries that he's established. So we are the only ones in all of creation that tend to live outside God's boundaries for life. And because of that, we're run down and exhausted. As Headley says, God deeply embedded into all of nature the law of natural boundaries. When we faithfully observe these boundaries, we do well. When we foolishly ignore them, we plunge ourselves into chaos and conflict. This rule applies to all of life and all relationships. It applies to how we relate to the limits of space time, relationships, and energy. It relates to our connection with the earth and all created things. And yes, it even applies to how we separate our personal identity from our occupation and our activities. Encouraging boundaries is a fundamental biblical principle. It's built by God into the very fabric of the universe to present his creation from falling into chaotic disarray. One does not have to look far to find the truth and the wisdom of this life. I guarantee that wherever one finds a person who doesn't demonstrate appropriate boundaries, one will find chaos and a life in constant turmoil and pain. On the other hand, wherever one finds healthy boundaries, one will find a rich, peaceful, and productive life. I find it interesting that, that some scholars have actually talked about how this story moves from chaos to order, from chaos to order, because God is bringing everything into its boundaries. Notice how it starts. The earth is formless and empty, and, and it's this idea of there's chaos over the land, and God says, let there be light, and he starts to establish the boundaries. You know, I, I've learned this purpose in my own life, that you know, back in the early days of my ministry, one of the first things I had to learn was how to establish boundaries. Right, boundaries, because balancing work and rest and ministry when, when you're pulled in a hundred different ways with all kinds of responsibilities, is, it's, it's difficult. It, it's not easy. And there are still times where I have to go back to that and say, okay, these are my boundaries. These are the limits. I, I'm not going to do more than one or two days a week at night. I, I, and when I do, I'm going to take some time off. During the day, I'm going to rest for a couple hours before I go into that meeting. Right? I have limited my, my downtime. I've scheduled it. Right? I've said, these are my days off, and I take that seriously. And, and if someone asks me to do something, I say, That's, I, I already got something booked. Because when we don't set limits, and we don't set boundaries, and we don't schedule them, it becomes very easy to blur the lines. It becomes very easy to let all the other stuff eat up our time. I think back to one of my favorite TV shows. It was on several years ago now. It's uh, the show 24. And in the very first episode of season one, uh, Kiefer Sutherland's character, Jack Bauer, his integrity is being put to the test. He's turned in some, uh, some, some guys, some of his own friends, for taking a few bribes and and some of his closest friends, even his boss, are starting to come down on him about how hey, you don't have to always be such a stickler to the rules. You don't have to be so honest all the time. Sometimes you can look the other way. And this is what he says. You can look the other way once and it's no big deal. Except it makes it easier for you to compromise the next time. And pretty soon that's all you're doing. You're compromising because you think that's how things are done. You know those guys that I blew the whistle on? You think they were bad guys? They, they, they weren't bad guys. They were just like you and me, but they compromised once. You see, burnout doesn't happen overnight. It starts with one small compromise. And then we make another compromise. And another compromise. And another compromise. And pretty soon it becomes this slippery slope. 
that takes us further and further and further away from the life that God desires. Boundaries are critical to the restoration of our souls. Thirdly, we see that we restore our souls when we establish a natural rhythm of work and rest in our lives. This natural rhythm. I don't know if you noticed it when I was reading this story, but this text is filled with all kinds of repetition. Right? Each day is constructed in the exact same order with the exact same phrases. And God said, let there be whatever he's creating that day. And there was. And God says that it's good. And he calls it whatever it is. And there's evening and there's morning, whatever day it is. The same pattern that is repeated over and over and over and over again. Suggesting that God himself is working with a natural rhythm and and cadence in his own life. That he's modeling for us this, this balance, this rhythm of daily life. Have you ever noticed how your days get thrown off when you change just one thing during the week? One thing changes from your, your everyday ordinary schedule and all of a sudden your entire week's messed up. I remember several years ago, we moved to worship practice at the church I was serving at the time from Thursday to Wednesday. And I was a part of the worship team um, there, so I was, you know, serving in that capacity. And I remember thinking every day that I woke up for the months after that, that it was Friday <laughs> instead of Thursday. That one small change, moving it from Thursday to Wednesday, screwed up. The rest of my week where I kept thinking it was a different day. Or, or maybe you've noticed how hard it is to shift from first to second shift or second to third shift or, or, or to adjust time zones or even to make that measly one hour shift in your clocks twice a year. You know, when you spring forward and you fall back. And how your body is just drained because of the shift in just one hour on the clock. You see, our bodies are meant to live with a natural rhythm, a natural cadence. They have biological clocks within them that we were created by God to live with this natural rhythm and pattern in our lives, to, to sleep at certain times, to be awake at certain times, to work at certain times, to, to eat at certain times, which is why your body gets hungry about the same time every single day. And whenever those rhythms become interrupted, Something else is thrown into our week. We have to make a change, or a new baby comes, or, or there's a time change, or we stay up late for an hour, or we get up a little bit earlier. Whenever anything happens that shifts that natural rhythm, our bodies become wore down a lot faster. I mean, it's been proven over and over again, scientifically, that we are better rested when we go to, the same, go to bed at the exact same time every night, and we get up at the exact same time the next morning that some of us might just need to set an alarm for when we go to bed that says I'm going to bed at this time every single night of the week because when our bodies are rested our souls are rested when our bodies are rested our emotional being is rested it it affects every single part of who we are because we are a connected being now, I wonder what would happen if we actually got enough sleep all week long. I, I wonder what would happen if we generally took one day and seven to rest. I wonder what would happen if we took regular breaks and we paced ourselves and we weren't always in a hurry, rushing from one thing to the next. I wonder what would happen if we began to live into the natural boundaries and rhythms of life that God created us to live within. How might that begin to restore your soul? Let's pray. Jesus, we come to you. And we thank you that you have said that rest is holy. That rest is a good thing, a necessary thing, a needed thing. And so I pray, Father, that you would help us 
to begin to embrace the need for regular, consistent periods of rest throughout our day, throughout our week, throughout our year. I pray that you would help us to begin to, to live within the natural boundaries that you've established, to, to establish a natural rhythm and cadence for our life that would revive our souls. We ask this in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord and our Savior. Amen. Well, hey, our next block party is going to be this coming Saturday from 5 to 7 out at Dan and Amanda Waddell's place. If you're interested in going and you need to know how to get there, feel free to shoot us an email at the church, hartzelumcblueash at gmail.com. We look forward to hearing from you, and may God bless you throughout this week. We'll see you later.